Welcome to the Great Detectors of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Give us a call, 208-991-4783, and uh, become one of our friends on Facebook, facebook.com slash radiodetectives. Uh, well, before we do get started, I want to let you know that this show was brought to you by the financial support of our listeners. Uh, thank you so much for your support. Here now is today's episode of Sherlock Holmes. This one's called The Affair of the Politician, The Lighthouse, and The Train Cormorant. A bit of a wordy title, but here goes. The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes for Men and 924 leading retail stores from coast to coast present the world's most famous detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our stories are based upon the character of Sherlock Holmes, created by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, and the dramatizations are by Edith Miser. And now for our weekly visit to the familiar firelit study of our old friend, Dr. Watson. We open the door and find the good doctor on his hands and knees rummaging through a travel-worn and battered tin dispatch box. Great Caesar's ghost, don't tell me that's the one, the famous box containing the records of Sherlock Holmes' unpublished cases. It is indeed, Mr. Harris, it is indeed. But I thought that was supposed to be kept deep in the vaults of the Bank of Cox and Company of Sharing Cross. Oh, not during the war, it wasn't, thank heaven. The bank was hit twice, you may remember. Yes, at the very beginning of the late unpleasantness, the government evacuated this box, along with several other notable British documents, such as certain Shakespeare folios, to a safe place in the country. Oh, I see. And they've just been returned to you now? Why the delay, Doctor? Would you believe it? They told me these papers were too valuable to be in private ownership. They claim they belong in the British Museum. I told them they could put these records in the British Museum when Holmes is safely buried in Westminster Abbey. A great many years from now, let's hope. Amen. Hmm, well, no. Yes, I've, uh, I've been going over these files to see if I couldn't find our subject for tonight's story. Yes, I, I think I can do no better than relate this one. The one to which Holmes invariably referred as the affair of the politician, the lighthouse, and the trained cormorant. And... But... Good heavens, where are my manners? Here you are, panting to say a few well-chosen words on behalf of those very generous gentlemen, our sponsors. Go ahead, Mr. Harris, go ahead. With pleasure, Dr. Watson. And my story today is very simple, but very important. It's a tale of the greatest values in clothes the American public has ever seen. Values that have rhyme and reason behind them, that are the result of a carefully laid out plan. Manufacturing ingenuity and a really great distribution idea make it possible for you to buy superlatively fine clipper craft clothes at astonishingly low prices. Yes, and right in your own local independent store where friendly attention is traditionally yours. Through the clipper craft plan, 924 leading stores across America have concentrated their buying power, bringing you tremendous savings in manufacturing and distribution costs. Take a look at Clippercraft's expensive-looking suits at only $35 and $40, with a few deluxe models at $43.75. And Clippercraft top coats and overcoats, too, at only $30 to $40. And sport jackets at only $24. You don't have to be a Sherlock Holmes to solve your clothes problem this fall. Simply compare Clippercraft with clothes selling for many dollars more. And now to get back to the politician, the lighthouse, and the trained cormorant. Uh, what exactly is a cormorant, Dr. Watson? A largest bird, Mr. Harris, that is inordinately fond of fish, which it dives into the water to catch. The word cormorant is a French derivation. Cor meaning raven, and marin meaning marine. Oh, yes, the raven of the sea. Sounds vaguely sinister, Dr. Watson. It was, Mr. Harris, it was indeed. This particular cormorant, whose name was Tika, was directly responsible for the death of the disreputable old baggage who uh, 
But, oh, there I go, getting ahead of myself again. Uh, to begin at the beginning, it was a cold, wet November night. A Saturday night, to be exact. Holmes, overcome with the restless energy which sometimes burned inside him like a seething volcano, had insisted on a visit to the Port of London, the Chinese section of it that is so often referred to in tones of awe and terror as Limehouse. We had uh, just turned off West India Dock Road. Against the sky rose Limehouse Church, the one thing of beauty in a sordid landscape. Yellow and brown men patted by on slippered feet. Strange voices, whispering in strange tongues, crept out of dark corners. The air was heavy with the stench of beetle nuts, shandu and fried fish. A clinging mist crept in off the river. In the channel, a foghorn wailed like a lost soul. Holmes, what's the point of all this meandering? First up one dilapidated alley, then down the next. I'm frozen to the bone. Let's get home before someone slits our throats from behind. A nice trick if it can be done, Watson. No, a stab in the back, or perhaps a bit of thuggy with a fine silken cord would be more in keeping with this neighborhood. What's the good of all this prowling about? But, Watson, we promised Mrs. Hudson we'd bring her some tea. Some suey sen in little two-ounce packets at sevenpence each. A shy little tea to fill the hour of four to five with delicate scents and dreams. The slop she's been giving us lately is enough to rot the lining of one's stomach. Well, then, let's buy the stuff and go home. That is, if you can remember where the shop is. It's just across the crazy bridge up ahead there that leads to the Isle of Dogs. A small spice shop run by my good friend, Sam Ling Lee. Well, then, let's go there and get it over with. Impatience, Watson, is the curse of our Western civilization. Always in a hurry. Never taking time to taste, to savor, really to observe life. Well, what is there worth observing in this godforsaken district, I'd like to know? <coughs> Quick, Watson, that's some duck into the doorway. You dirty little thief! I'll fix you! Good Lord, Holmes, that man was chasing her with a stiletto. After them, down the next alley. Too late, Watson. Great Scott, Holmes. Aren't you going to do something? What is there to do, Watson? A poor, tortured soul. She's better off dead. Holmes, you are a cold-blooded fish. At least we could try to catch the man who stabbed her. That is a job for the official police. We must leave something for them to do, you know. Incidents like this occur every day in Limehouse. No, the individual I'd like to bring to justice is the real murderer in this and a hundred other cases. Who's that? The purveyor of little white packages like the one that poor frantic derelict clutched so tightly in her hand. The chief of the outfit which peddles death and decay in the form of exotic dreams. You know who he is? Naturally. The annoying part of the situation is that I've been completely unable to persuade any of his victims to testify against him. They're all so tragically dependent on him for his filthy wares. Oh, but enough of that. What we've just witnessed is commonplace. But here comes something I think you'll admit is rather unusual, even in Limehouse. Yes, what do you mean? Look there, across the street, Watson. Ever see a man take a bird for a walk? It's Paru, the crippled Lasker, taking Tika for his nightly outing. They're coming down the steps of the house across the way. They're crossing the street. That's a curious-looking bird. It waddles like a duck. But its beak is different. Its neck is almost as long as a swan's. That, Watson, is a cormorant, a very intelligent biped. In many tropical countries, the natives train them to catch fish. Ah, do not fear, my beautiful Tika. The men will not harm you. Baru will protect his Tika. Well, I'll be... Undoubtedly, Watson. Paru couldn't be more attached to Tika if he were his own son. But, uh, did you see the bird's eyes? They shone yellow in the light of the street lamp like a cat's. Yes, many of the natives hereabouts are afraid of the bird. They say he has the evil eye. Perhaps that's why Paru and Tika are considered star boarders at the lighthouse across the way. The lighthouse? It's the name of the most notorious lodging house in all of Limehouse. Chinese, Laskers, and East Indians sleep there, ten and twelve to a room on the bare floors or on mildewed mattresses. 
Tika and Peru sleep curled up in a closet on the top floor. At least they have privacy. Mm, charming place. Why in heaven's name don't the authorities clean it out? Authority around here, Watson, is Harry Hawkins. Called Handsome Harry by the natives because he's so definitely the opposite. Mr. Hawkins not only owns most of the houses in this area, he's councilman for this district. Yes, but surely it's not good business to let your property go to rack and ruin like that place across the way. The lighthouse, Watson, is run by a vicious old reprobate who's known as Mother Fishface. Partly because she has no teeth and a cold and fishy eye, and partly because she runs a fish house in the kitchen under the steps where she dispenses decayed fish and chips at tuppence a portion to the poor starving wretches who inhabit the rooms upstairs. Mother Fishface is the only one who dares talk back to Mr. Hawkins. She's the only one who dares to be late with her rent. In fact, it's rumored that she has something on the old boy, and he's definitely afraid of her. There's where the body's buried, eh, Holmes? Or how he procures the opium and hashish he undoubtedly deals in. I suspect most of her boarders are smugglers of the vile stuff. Hmm. So we came down here for the purpose of buying tea for Mrs. Hudson, and now we suddenly seem to be interested in a dope-running outfit. Holmes, you don't fool me for a moment. <laughs> Five years' association with Sherlock Holmes seems to have sharpened your powers of observation, my dear Watson. Well, you... Quiet, Watson. Quick, slip behind this wall. Here comes Mr. Hawkins on his weekly collection rounds. Open up there. Saturday night. Rent stew. Here's your money, Mr. Hawkins. Blast you. Charming fellow, Mr. Hawkins. Quiet, Watson. He's about to knock on the kitchen door opposite. Let's see what happens at the lighthouse. Hi, dear mother. It's me, Anson Mary. Come to pay you a visit. What do you want, you old fool? What would I want, dearie? It's Saturday night. Rent night. You're a week behind now. Suppose it I am. You ain't starving. You can wait, can't you? No, no, old girl. You know I wouldn't press me old sweetheart. Here, look. I brought you a present. A fine bottle of gin. What's wrong with it? Is it poisoned? Oh, have your little joke, won't you, dearie? No, I don't think you do a thing like that, Harry. The day they find me murdered... Ah, that's the day you'll wish you'd never been born. Oh, you do run on. If anything was to happen to you, you know it'd break me heart. <laughs> Wouldn't it just? Ah, uh, here comes that cripple and his bleeding bird. It's always sneaking into me door and making away with a fish. Uh, them birds has a weakness for fish. Well, if he don't keep out of my kitchen, it'll be the weakness that finishes him. Hey, you there, Peru. Yes, Madam Fishface. Keep your dirty bird out of my kitchen. And don't you call me Madam. My tika is not as dirty as your kitchen. And as for your fish, I would not feed it to a swine, much less my beautiful tika. There he goes, sticking his head in the door. Here, get out, you. Stop. Go on. Stop. Do not raise that broom to my tika. Not raise the broom, is it? Listen to me, you slimy even. That bird comes into my kitchen once more and I'll wring his bleeding neck. You listen to me, Madam Fishface, and listen well. You touch one feather of tika's beautiful neck and I will kill you. I will kill you dead. Yeah, now, that's enough. I'll have no one threatening Mother Fishface. You heard what he said. You heard him. There. Out he goes, out of my house. Let him sleep in the streets. Let him sleep in the, in the gutter with his dirty bird. Now, 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 Mother, don't you get your dandered up. Go on in and drink your bottle. That's a good girl. It's Saturday night, remember? You've got a little spree coming to you. I know what I'm doing. No one has to tell me. Come, Tika. We do not enter her filthy premises again. We go sleep in the churchyard. It is warmer than Madam Fishface's heart. Well, that little commotion seems to have resolved itself, eh, Mr. Holmes? I wonder. 
At any rate, the fog's lifted a bit. We'd better get around to Sam Lee's place before he shuts up his shop. I could do with a dish of hot tea. A dish? <laughs> It'd take a gallon to warm me up. Well, come along, then. It's no good loitering at Mother Fishface's door any longer, Mr. Hawkins. I fancy she and her bottle are locked in for the weekend. Oh, and Blake. Oh, it's you. And what is the eminent Mr. Sherlock Holmes snooping around here for, eh? Snooping? My dear Mr. Hawkins, you underrate me. Dr. Watson and I were merely enjoying the local colour. You have such lurid local colour in this district. Haven't you? Well... Delicious. A true Lapsang Sushang. Smoky, with a suggestion of a true tarred rope flavor. Mm, not bad. Could do with a spot of rum in it, though. Typically British reaction, Watson. The Englishman's always insulting his palate and desecrating his tea with surpluses. Cream, milk, rum, even nasty little pieces of lemon. At any rate, the libation served its purpose. It's thawed you out. Oh, I've drunk so much tea, I'm a wash. My back teeth are practically floating. Never mind, you look less blue around the gills. Oh, I wish you wouldn't use that expression, Holmes. It brings back that horrible old woman's face. You see, she, she did look like a fish, you know. A dead fish. Uh, she... Hello. Look out of the window. Here's handsome Harry running down the street. Yes, seems to be headed in this direction. Yes, here he comes. Oh, Miss... Mr. Holmes. Oh, thanks. Thank heavens, Jerry. Uh, and your friend, too. I think you said he was a doctor. Yes, I'm a medical man. What seems to be the trouble, Mr. Hawkins? Uh, you better come right away. She'll be needing you. Uh, no mistake. Who'll be needing home? What's happened? It's Mother Fishface. After I'd finished my collections, I went back to tell her about the plumbers coming in on Monday. But the door was locked, and she wouldn't answer. Probably the result of too rapid absorption of the bottle you left behind. Oh, you're right here. Uh, not answering the door wouldn't upset me most times. Only tonight, there's a great smell of gas leaking out around it. Gas? Hurry, Watson. Let's hope we're not too late. Here we are. Two steps down. Careful. Top one's loose. Smell of gas. <clears throat> Very pronounced, eh, Holmes? Quite. Door locked. Shall I... Shall I break it down? Windows quicker. Stand back. I'll use this loose brick. Phew. What a stench. Still fish and gas. Give it a chance to clear for a moment. I see. There she is, Holmes. You can see her lying there behind the table. But what's that draped across her leg like a snake? It's not a snake, Watson. It's Tika's neck. The bird is doubtless lying beside her, hidden by the body. Tika! Come on, over Tika. the sill we go. Tika! Did someone see Chica? I look everywhere for him. I am asleep on a grave, and Chica sits on the tombstone. When I wake up, he's gone. He's in there, Paru. I'm afraid we've come too late. Chica! My beautiful Chica! She has destroyed him! All right, come in, all of you. I kill her. I slit her throat. Paru, put away that knife. Take the bird outside. Try artificial respiration. Don't waste any time. Watson, you look out for the old woman. My pretty, my beautiful. Here, yeah, I better turn off this here gas jet on the stove. It's wide open. Don't touch it. But confounded, did you have to do that? Well, you, you, you didn't want to asphyxiate a lot of us, did you? No, but I did want to examine that handle for fingerprints. <laughs> No go, Holmes. I can't bring her round. She's turning cold. Yes, gas poisoning. That's what finished her. Unusually florid face. Gas poisoning complicated by cerebral thrombosis brought on by alcohol and high blood pressure. Yes, I noticed the uneven dilation of her pupils. Yes. Poor old dear. One never knows, eh, Mr. Holmes? Who'd have thought the next time I saw her, she'd be lying there like that, cold as a mackerel. But if she wanted to commit suicide, Mr. Hawkins, why was only one gas jet open? Why not turn on the lot, eh, Holmes? I doubt very much if it was suicide, Watson. You, you don't mean it's murder? 
But the door was locked. No one could have got in. Well, that's right, Mr. Rams. She never gave no one the key. It, it, it must have been accidental. Or at least it, that's what it was supposed to look like. What brings you to that fascinating conclusion, Mr. Hawkins? It was that bird what did it, mark my words. Time and again he knocked that gas jet open. Always her mother fish face would scream at him and, 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 and shut it off. Only tonight, like as not, she was too drunk to notice. Drunk from the gin you brought her? I always brought her a bottle of gin on Saturday nights. It was that dirty Alaska did it. You heard him say he'd kill her. He knew she'd be drunk. And he shoved his bird in here. He did it. Knowing he'd turn on the gas, reaching for a fish frying under the stove. Yes, there was a fish on the stove. But it was not frying because there's no frying pan. If there had been, the gas would have been lit and there'd have been no chance for it to escape and fill the room. Yes, there was a fish on the stove, carefully draped across this handle. You'll notice that it's still greasy and smells rather strongly of mackerel. These scratches, I imagine, were caused by the bird's beak as he snatched at the fish, thereby pushing the handle and opening the jet. Well, that's what I said. That dirty heathen pushed his scrawny old bird in here, knowing Mother Fishface was lying helpless drunk with no way of protecting herself. And how did he manage to push the bird in here with all the doors and windows locked? Oh, oh I see what you mean. And it couldn't have been murder. It was accidental, lot. The bird flew himself in. And how did he manage to do that? Oh, through that little trap door. Up there beside the window. It, it's got a little swinging hinge to it. So the fish peddler could deliver fish through it when Mother Fishface wasn't down. That blinking bird, he flew up there, he did. Shoved open the trap and flew down the, into the room. What happened next was just like you deduced it, Mr. Holmes. It, it, it must have been. Poor old Mother Fishface, murdered accidental by a bird. Very interesting theory, Mr. Hawkins, but unfortunately it does not jibe with the facts. What do you mean, Holmes? Simply this, Watson. The bird couldn't have flown in because it so happens that this particular member of the feathered tribe is an Anopterum harisi, or, or Harris cormorant, which occurs only on the Galapagos Islands. It is entirely flightless. You mean it, it can't fly? Not any farther than Dr. Watson. But it did get in here somehow, Holmes. You have to admit that. Quite. The cormorant was introduced into this kitchen by the only person, other than old Mother Fishface, who had the key to that door. Who's that? You, Mr. Hawkins, the landlord. Rubbish. Well, why should I have wanted to kill the old girl? She was my best tenant. You killed her because you suspected she was going to spit to the port authorities. You got wind of the fact they'd sent me down here to get her story. You can't prove it. You can't prove a blasted thing. Supposing you have got my fingerprints in that gas jet. Dr. Watson here is witness to the fact that he saw me turn it off. Is that so, Holmes? Yeah, but you'll not find my fingerprints in the lock or in that doorknob, neither. I wondered why they were wiped clean. You were here earlier this evening. Your fingerprints should have been on the doorknob. Well, they ain't now. You can't convict me on that. What about the odor of fish that clings to your hands? Too bad you chose mackerel to lure Tika. Such a smelly fish. Furthermore, the notes on the papers which Watson discovered inside the woman's bodies... But Holmes, I... convict you of conducting a despicable and entirely illegal trade in opium. Another... But... Why, Mr. Hawkins, where are you going? Oh, I'm getting out. I won't get me. No, the detection and on me. Holmes, why didn't you stop him? He'll be stopped, never fear. The authorities have had the place surrounded ever since we left the tea house. Sam Lee is my go-between. Or didn't you guess? You know, dashed well, I didn't. Furthermore, I don't know what you're talking about when you mention the papers I found in Mother Fishface's bodice. There weren't any papers. I know, Watson. Bluff. Pure bluff. The important thing is Hawkins thinks we've found those papers. It's remarkable how talkative the average criminal becomes once he thinks the jig's up. The port authorities should have no trouble in finding out all they want to know. Yes, at last, the chief of this dope-smuggling ring and the cause of untold human misery will be safely behind bars. Mr. Holmes, did you hear that? Yes, it's Tika. I thought Paru might be able to bring him round. You see, he didn't have as much alcohol in his system as Mother Fishface. Let that be a lesson to you, Watson. You go to blazes. <laughs> It's a problem for the average family these days. Practically every necessity costs more, and most family budgets are not elastic. But there's one thing a man can buy today that gives him the most for his money he's ever known. Yes, even these days. Without the sacrifice of quality, you can buy really fine Clippercraft clothes for far less than ordinary clothes cost elsewhere. And in your own local independent store, where you get friendly personal attention. 
It's all made possible by the Clippercraft plan, concentrating the buying power of 924 leading stores from coast to coast. Stores you can trust. Stores where Clippercraft quality is still sold at amazingly low prices. Even today, Clippercraft suits are only 35 and 40 dollars, with a few special numbers at 4375. Even today, top coats and overcoats are only 30 to 40 dollars, and sport jackets but 24 dollars. Selling beautifully tailored, expensive clothes, inexpensive in price, at the nation's finest independent stores, is the great big idea behind the Clippercraft plan. That's why men who know insist on Clippercraft clothes. So be sure to visit the Clippercraft store in your city. The leading stores in the metropolitan area that bring you Clippercraft clothes are Saks 34th, Broadway at 34th Street, Manhattan, Abraham and Strauss, Brooklyn, the Boulevard Men's Shop, Kresge, Newark, Newark, New Jersey, and the B&B Clothes Shop, 16408 Jamaica Avenue, Jamaica. These great, courteous, and friendly stores are proud to add their names to that of Clippercraft in the label of your suit, top coat, sports jacket, and overcoat. And now, Dr. Watson, did they succeed in convicting the handsome Mr. Harry Hawkins? They did indeed, Mr. Harris. They did indeed. Mr. Hawkins spilled the beans, as you say, with very little persuasion. As a matter of fact, Mother Fishface did have quite a few incriminating records tucked away carefully, which we subsequently found. Uh, hidden in an old teapot or the family flower barrel, no doubt. Hidden away in a vault in the bank in Threadneedle Street, together with a very handsome collection of English bank notes. Oh, thrifty old gal. Who inherited the money, Doctor? Holmes <laughs> saw to it that the money went to the Limehouse Mission for Stranded Seamen. He also arranged for Peru to spend his declining years there. He even managed to wangle a permission for him to keep Tika perched on the foot of his bed. Mm, I guess there's nothing that can't be done if Sherlock Holmes sets his mind to it. I agree, Mr. Harris. I, of course, I, uh, I wouldn't want Holmes to know about it. <laughs> when did Holmes first suspect that Hawkins had murdered old Mother Fishface, Doctor? Oh, he was pretty sure of it, Mr. Harris, when he realized Hawkins had run for a doctor without first stopping to break a window or turn off the gas. In other words, Hawkins was taking no chances the old girl might come to. <laughs> That's about the size of it. And now I wonder if you'd like to give us an idea about what we can look forward to next week, Dr. Watson. Well, now, let me see. I, uh... Well, I think that next week I'll tell you how witchcraft suddenly came to life again in the west of England and how the investigation of a fairy ring in the grass and a weather-beaten broomstick covered with medieval recipe for flying ointment led Holmes to one of the most diabolical criminals he ever encountered. I call it the laughing lemur of High Tower Heath. Sounds appropriate for what is practically Halloween. Why do you think I chose it, Mr. Harris? Why do you think I chose it? The makers of Clipper Craft Clothes and 924 leading stores from coast to coast have brought you another in the new series of broadcasts featuring the world's most famous detective... Sherlock Holmes. Sherlock Holmes is produced and directed by Basil Lochran, with special music by Albert Berman. Holmes is played by John Stanley, Dr. Watson by Alfred Shirley. If you don't know your Clippercraft dealer, write Clippercraft, 200 Fifth Avenue, New York City. Your National Guard is destined to play a more important part than ever before in America's security plans. The National Guard offers young men regular army pay and training without interference with their normal civilian life. If you are between the ages of 17 and 35, married or single, join your local unit of the National Guard. Be sure to listen next week to Sherlock Holmes in the Laughing Lemur of Hightower Heath. If you'd like to attend the Sherlock Holmes broadcast in New York, see your local Clipper Craft dealer. He'll tell you how to obtain your tickets. <laughs> this is Cy Harris speaking for Clipper Craft Clothes. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Well, 
Holmes and Watson tend to spat a bit more than in most other versions. Still, this was a very atmospheric uh, case. I, I, I don't know if the murder, the identity of the murderer was much in doubt. The intro was kind of interesting with Watson having the idea of burying uh, Sherlock Holmes in Westminster Abbey, which I guess if Holmes were a uh, real person would make sense, though he would be the only private detective uh, buried there. But then again, Sherlock Holmes isn't just any private detective. All right, well, we do have uh, one listener comment. It's just a simple great shows from Podcast Alley. And that'll actually do it for uh, today. We'll be back tomorrow with yours truly, Johnny Dollar. In the meanwhile, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And give us a call, 208-991-4783. Also, if you're a new listener, I want to let you know that we do have other old-time radio podcasts. Uh, we do one episode of Dragnet a week, available at RadioDragnet.com. Uh, also, uh, we're working through the Superman radio serial. We're in the middle of the Atom Man uh, serial. And uh, LaserAndSword.com is where you can uh, subscribe to that. But uh, from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.